All right, here we go. Next slide. Right, the International Energy Agency predicts that by about 2050, there's no reason why we couldn't reach an installed capacity of 750 gigawatts of offshore renewable energy. It's a pretty substantial amount of energy and enables us to meet many of the demands for uh, certainly electricity. Obviously, this isn't doing anything to replace hydrocarbons for uh, vehicles and such like, but that's a separate question to do with the, uh, the uptake of uh, electric vehicles. But it does enable us to have a realistic chance of being able to hit much of the domestic electricity demand and industrial electricity demand in industrialized countries. The image I've shown on the right there is from a, a very worthwhile document. It's a Global Marine Technology Trends 2030 uh, that came out from Lloyd's Register, joint work with the University of Southampton and Kinetic. I've given the URL link down there at the bottom. And what I can do is share, uh, when I share this video on YouTube, after we've given the talk today, you'll, you'll be able to go back to that image and download that URL if you haven't been able to grab it in time. Uh, the report covers shipping, materials, uh, nanomaterials, marine autonomous systems, many, many subjects of interest to an SUT audience. But it goes into quite a lot of detail too about offshore renewable energy and particularly the prospects of being able to have uh, combined offshore energy sites that are mixing floating solar, floating wind, hydrogen production, co-located alongside aquaculture plants. Uh, so you, you end up with multiple streams of income for whoever is operating the, uh, the, the, the location. A very interesting report and very, very much worth a read of. So we have quite a lot of potential sources for marine renewable energy. Uh, it's, we can look at uh, wind, which we're gonna look at today, hydrogen, solar, tide, wave, tidal streams and currents, aquatic biomass, and ocean energy, uh, ocean thermal energy conversion. Why use it at all? Well, first of all, it's a huge resource. There's more than enough to provide all of the power that humanity requires long term once we get this stuff properly developed and up to a mature level. It's obviously low carbon, and we do have to decarbonize energy production to avoid global warming, ocean acidification, sea level rise, low air quality, lots of other reasons. And also energy security. By using local power generated at sea in your own exclusive economic zone, you're avoiding having to rely on foreign suppliers for energy and also avoid you having to use your foreign currency reserves to buy up your fuel from abroad. Just a couple of very brief shots reminding us of the importance of the climate change aspects. Uh, nice paper published today, uh, Shukman et al. looking at the Earth's energy imbalance. This is how humans are now contributing more heat into the system than the uh, natural system is able to balance out quite nicely. It's confirming the figures we've seen in the past from ocean science observations of approximately 90% of the extra heat that humans have generated in the last century or so residing in the ocean. So it looks like about 52% of it is in the top 700 meters, 28% between 700 meters and 2000 meters, 9% below 2000 meters. You know, only one to 2% of that energy is stored in the atmosphere. You know, the, the ocean is holding by far the majority of the additional heat generated through uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution. And the real world rapid loss of ice, particularly from the Greenland ice sheet, is also turning out to be tracking above the worst case scenario curves. Uh, I've got an interview for the podcast later this afternoon with uh, expert John Englander, and uh, that will be quite an interesting podcast going out in the next few weeks. Uh, John resides in Florida, so he's uh, very sensitive to sea level rise, as uh, his home state will be one of the first to submerge over the next century or two. But um, very substantial 
rate of increase going on at the moment and we are going to have to work very very hard to adapt to these higher sea levels and this is literally hot off the press uh, my uh, former colleague dr mark brandon who's a specialist in uh, polar climate sent me this one today um, Arctic sea ice currently tracking two and a half million square kilometers below the 1981 to 2010 mean. You know, I think it's, so it's not just the ice over Greenland that's melting at quite a prodigious rate. We're also seeing the sea ice in the Arctic pretty, you know, tracking at a very consistent rate, uh, well below its historical mean. And finally, ocean acidification, as long as we're burning coal in particular, then oil, then gas, we are affecting the pH, the acidity of the global ocean. That global ocean provides every second breath of oxygen you breathe. It provides the basis of the whole marine food chain of these uh, marine calcifiers, the planktonic creatures and other things that rely on the ocean staying within a certain pH range. So it's essential, even if adding all those greenhouse gases into the atmosphere had no effect whatsoever on climate. We still need to eliminate them because of the impact they're having on ocean acidification and on future sea level rise. So it's, uh, it's gotta go. And where's the easiest place to find a substitute? Well, I'm going to argue that it's from marine renewable energy. So our first and second generation wind farms are already providing substantial sources of the energy in the UK and Northwest Europe. Uh, if you go on any of the various apps and websites uh, lurking around there on the internet that track energy production and consumption, uh, there's quite a few good ones. Uh, you'll find them rapidly with a Google search. You'll see that we, we commonly now exceed 20% of the UK's uh, electricity requirements through uh, the wind sector on a good blustery day it can head up a, a long way behind that now there's a there's a chap just uh, joining the meeting uh keith keith henson uh who actually took this photograph it'll probably take him a moment or so to uh come on uh, for his audio to work uh, keith is actually working at this very moment at the hornsea one site and this is one of his photographs uh, taken in the last few days, and Keith pointed out to me. <laughs> my photo. It is indeed, Keith. You're you're you you are live at this very moment. You've joined us at the. Sorry, I do time. apologise, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this is great. And um, I was just going to say to our listeners that you 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 said to me this morning that you've got 174 Siemens seven megawatt turbines there, 1.2 gigawatts, and that's double the output of the very similar size London array, which has 175 turbines that was only built a few years ago so the technology has advanced that quickly in just what's that eight nine years keith yeah yeah, yeah. So. we just might lose second that's all right yeah anyway i'll i'll, I'll, I'll carry on talking but uh, if any of you have got specific questions about offshore wind and particularly the hornsea project uh do try and ask Keith some questions as we go through the meeting as well. He's actually afloat at the moment, just off the uh, one of the offshore transformers out there in, in the North Sea. So costs are falling. They're already competitive. It already doesn't make much sense to build new coal-fired power stations because the cost of the renewables is falling so fast. It's an established, it's an effective technology, and we're already at the stage now where the first generation wind farms uh, built with much smaller uh, turbine uh, blades are already starting to be decommissioned and replaced by more modern, higher capacity systems. And this is just a little montage of Keith's photographs uh, that, 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 that he put on his Facebook page in the last couple of days on the Hornsea offshore site construction. I was uh, particularly taken with what to me looked rather like the Teletubbies Nunu, wow. and, and indeed turns out to be its nickname, uh, the object down there on the bottom left, which is uh, essentially an underwater vacuum cleaner, uh, you, know, you know, being used for uh, clearing sediments from around some of the offshore sites when they're installing and uh, uh, also decommissioning older pieces of equipment. 
right. Oh, sorry. Mouse problems here. Um, now, here's some images from the DNVGL report. Uh, this is dated November 2019, so it's a, a, few, a few months out of date now. But this gave an idea of how many offshore wind sites are already under development around the world. And we have uh, North America, two active, 12 under development. Europe, of course, the very well established offshore wind sector now, 92 sites already active, 70 under develop, uh, development, not including the two down there in the Mediterranean. And Asia Pacific, only 30 active, but 92 under development. And I'm sure that as the next few years go by, we'll start seeing gaps being filled in off uh, Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, and also into Australia and New Zealand as well. The other striking thing you'll note from the image on the bottom right there is how much the wind turbine uh, sizes have increased, the actual diameter of the blades. Many of the things you'll see on land, especially the older, fast spinning, somewhat noisier uh, turbines are one megawatt, sometimes even less. Uh, where I live in South Wales, we're already seeing quite a number of the, you know, the, the big sort of seven megawatt and larger uh, size blades. They're attractive things. They turn slowly. They're very, very big. Wingspan's bigger than a 747 or an Airbus 380. And uh, I know beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but uh, I look at them and find them quite elegant, attractive looking machines. And Keith was telling me this morning that... Uh, a single rotation of one of the now what size was it was that a three megawatt blade keith you were talking about i think a, a single rotation would power a house for a day uh, that's uh, one of the seven megawatt ones here at hornsey that's a seven is it okay so a seven megawatt turbine one single rotation that's one house for one day uh, so by the time you multiply that then by the 174 blades you've got you know with their 24 7 operation you're powering about 2 to 2.5 million homes you know for, for, from a project of that size now we start moving into the future aspects now which is the main focus of the talk the the first and second generation wind farms by some definition some of the third generations too they they tend to be built in relatively shallow waters uh, usually less than 20 meters, sometimes um, a little bit deeper. And as you go into those, uh, you know, as you start moving into deeper waters, the complexity of the installation increases considerably. The cost of the installation, if you're trying to hammer in those monopiles, goes up quite a lot. It typically takes about 800 hammer blows with a hydraulic system to try and get these monopiles you know, bashed into soft seabed sediments. And also the wind farms aren't necessarily in the optimum location. You're putting them where the seabed conditions are right and the nature of the rock is right, rather than where the best wind is, where the strongest wind is uh, the optimum location. So once you free yourself of that limitation of having to be hammered into the local seabed sediment, it in you know, you, you, you get a dramatically improved uh, long-term performance gain, you know, on your offshore wind farm. You also have the ability to be able to build the structures, you know, in the shore based shipyard and just float them out and anchor them in place rather than some of the more complex processes you need to do with a, uh, you know, a, a fixed monopile type installation. So quite a few designs already out there on the market. The first one to go into service was the uh, high wind system uh, built in Norway. There's a photograph of it down there on the bottom left uh, being floated out uh, after it was built. And more of these are now beginning to appear both in the North Sea and in other areas of the world. Different mooring designs, some just use floating loose moorings uh, essentially anchored into place. That's the kind of central illustration there. And there is also variations on the ten tension leg uh, platform type design that we've already seen in use in the oil and gas sector and also in you know, more, you know, more flexible type floating wind farms. Uh, a lot of cost benefits. You can build these things in large clusters and tow them out into deep water 
into an optimum location well away from a wind farm. And one that we're just seeing um, approval for just in the last few days, uh, the latest project's been approved is going to be in South Wales. It's, uh, that's right, it was announced 19th of August. It's a development by Blue Gem Wind and it's a joint venture between Total and Simply Blue Energy. So the Crown Estate, who acts as the landlord for the seabed, uh, certainly off the UK coast, has awarded the seabed rights for a 96 megawatt floating wind demonstration project, which will be about 44 kilometers off the Pembrokeshire coastline. So it's over the horizon. It's going to be out of sight in terms of anybody who's worried about its impacts on the tourist industry there. And it also means it's possible to put the wind farm away from some of the coastal shipping lanes that are in the area and into the space with the optimum wind field. And the UK Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult estimates there could be about 50 gigawatts of wind capacity remaining out there in the Celtic Sea. So water too deep to use a conventional hammered in monopile. And each, well, certainly the first gigawatt, which is the one where you start getting the investment, could be worth about 3,000 jobs, seeing 682 million in supply chain opportunities in Wales and Cornwall by 2030. So we're going to see the floating offshore wind sector begin to grow from a, a small beginning into becoming a very substantial sector over this next decade. But the the million dollar or possibly billion dollar question when you start going down the route of floating wind or indeed floating solar as we go on to next is obviously the intermittent nature of the power resource. So if you can find a way to combine your potentially intermittent energy source with energy storage, then you're onto a, a real winner. And I think this is going to be an area where we see quite a lot of the new investment uh, coming in in the next few years. So I'm just letting in another participant. Right, you'll see there on the top right, some of the um, costs for um, US dollars, uh, kilowatts per year for energy storage. And as you'll see, uh, lithium ion comes in reasonably good value. Good old fashioned lead acid batteries below that. Flywheels are expensive. But there's one they mention here referred to as the gravitricity rate. And if this works, I'm just going to show you a short video here. Um, let's see if it works. I don't know if you'll hear the sound or not. I hope so. Renewable energy production fluctuates throughout the day, as does demand. We need to store excess energy when the wind blows or the sun shines, so it can be released <sighs> when demand outstrips supply. Already, we can store energy using pumped storage and with batteries. At Gravitricity... Sorry, I think it, uh, it might have stopped sharing there, so I'll, I'll, I'll resume pressing. Renewable back. energy production fluctuates throughout the day, as does demand. We need to store excess energy when the wind blows or the sun shines, so it can be released when demand outstrips supply. Already, we can store energy using pumped storage and with batteries. Okay, people are messaging to say you can't see the video. So that's uh, frustrating. What I'll do is um, when I get to the end of the PowerPoint, I'll bring up the video in a separate window, and then hopefully that will, that will work. Because it's, wor it's worth seeing. It's, um, it's a company, it's a concept invented by Peter Frankel, who's one of the... SUT uh, committee members and uh, Peter's done some really nice work on uh, basically using disused mine shafts uh, and uh, uh, weights that you know move up and down to store and transfer electricity so I'll uh, we'll come back to that at the end so all right so let's move on to offshore hydrogen this, I'm sure, many of you are already familiar with and is going to turn out to be, in my humble opinion, the big industry that's going to grow over the next 10, 15 years. Many, many concepts being prepared now for the production and storage of hydrogen offshore. 
uh, option one and probably the the preferred one certainly in terms of an environmental change uh, angle is green hydrogen where we're using electrolysis of seawater from renewable energy to uh, electrolyze hydrogen out of seawater and you know we're never going to run out of seawater and of course when you burn hydrogen what do you get water so the cycle continues so it's it's a eminently renewable and clean energy source blue hydrogen is also hydrogen production but using hydrogen extracted from natural gas so you're bringing up natural gas in your usual manner and you're processing it to extract the carbon you bury the carbon put it back into geological storage and just retain your hydrogen aspect it's a more expensive way of uh, producing gas uh, you know by adding in all those intermediate stages you really are better off if at all possible just sticking to uh, electrolysis straight from the seawater cut out the middleman and all that so hydrogen production i believe will be a major offshore industry by 2030 it's a it's a fast way to try and achieve low carbon energy we're already seeing the major companies including woodside group the korea gas corporation hyundai siemens bosch or steadvest as all investing in hydrogen it has strong political support from governments who signed up to the paris uh, climate change agreements we've just seen the european union sign up to a, a very major investment in uh, hydrogen production capacity and uh, transport capacity over the coming decades we're also seeing pilot projects underway now for the transportation of hydrogen, uh, trying to understand how much hydrogen we can mix into the natural gas supply so it can contribute to home heating. Uh, companies such as Bosch are working on hydrogen powered uh, central heating boilers. And there are also uh, other projects underway to see how you perhaps use the hydrogen to make ammonia or use it to actually make hydrocarbons. Uh, lots of uh, techniques to be able to turn that hydrogen into an easily stored, easily transportable uh, fuel source for the future. And harnessing offshore wind to produce green hydrogen is already at the point of becoming reality. Uh, we saw Keith's photographs earlier of the Horn C1 program. Uh, Orsted are moving into a 1.4 gigawatt Horn C2 phase and that's intended to uh, power the production of green hydrogen as well under something called the GigaStack project uh, which received funding from the UK government back in March. Now phase two of GigaStack uh, is a collaboration between uh, Orsted Elemental Energy, Philips 66 and ITM Power and they intend to deliver the hydrogen in um, stacked five megawatt electrolyzers in built in large factories using the offshore electricity and they will feed directly into the Humber side um, uh, cluster of companies uh, that are producing you know you know chemicals and other other products so the Humber side are working closely with the Hornsea projects on being a pilot area for clean hydrogen based uh, economic growth so it's going to be really exciting seeing how that takes off i think we're going to see a similar initiative beginning to emerge on the west coast as well uh, certainly building that uh, floating wind farms off the pembrokeshire coast and the interest from the milford haven cluster uh, i wouldn't be at all surprised if in the next few years we see moves to have a another hydrogen cluster down there in west wales or in devon and cornwall as well so this is definitely an area i think that we're going to see grow quite markedly in coming years offshore solar energy now we've already seen small scale systems being tested such as the uh the system in the image there it's not very large at all this is something that's been tested by the uh the dutch in their coastal waters just an 8.5 kilowatt project that floated out in November but the idea is for that to be expanded up to 100 megawatts quite rapidly 
And of course, the thing with floating solar is that you can co-locate it with your existing offshore wind power infrastructure. So your cables, et cetera, that have already been put in to feed the offshore wind industry can easily then be attached to the floating solar systems as well. It works extremely well in collaborate in um, combination with offshore aquaculture. Fish like living underneath floating structures on the surface. It's why so many systems that float around in tropical waters get uh, stolen and repurposed by the local fishing community as fish aggregation devices. So, you know, having these large sheltering solar panels floating offshore over aquaculture cages could turn out to be a bit of a win-win for the offshore aquaculture people as well as the offshore energy folk. And uh, the, the Dutch certainly believe that they can meet 50% of their own energy demands from uh, floating solar. This would be taking advantage of the relatively sheltered waters uh, that you find in a place like the Zoida Zee and other areas of reclaimed uh, shallow waters around the Dutch coast. And I don't know how well these things stand up to stormy conditions. I, I imagine a, a decent North Sea winter storm might create havoc with a floating uh, solar farm if it's not built in a very robust manner. But in the right waters and certainly in, in sheltered areas and places that aren't subject to extreme winter weather, I suspect that offshore solar could turn out to be quite a a significant source of future growth and what we are seeing is in China it's already becoming very big indeed um, if you fly into some of the Chinese uh, coastal cities you'll quite often see large floating arrays in inland waters or in their large lakes a dominant company one called SunGrow Power uh, website sungrowpower.com is already offering uh, floating solar voltaic systems innovative very large and I believe that in the future these will be matched with the hydrogen electrolysis plant that we've already seen uh, starting to be mooted for offshore wind to provide green hydrogen power as well so very strong possibilities that we're going to see offshore wind and offshore solar working together with the offshore hydrogen industry to be significant energy producers in the future. Good sectors to get early engagement with and good sectors probably to buy a few shares in. I should, I should think these things are going to do pretty well long term. So a quick look now at the offshore wave, tidal and current side of things. As we all know, there have been many, many designs over the last 50 years. Some of you will remember the Salter Duck and other such uh, devices, even going back to the late 70s and early 80s. Many prototype installations have been built and installed with varying levels of success. The wave power devices have struggled perhaps the most in the market. The, the very nature of what you're trying to do requires strong, robust engineering to survive those winter storms or even uh, severe weather in summer months and large well-engineered structures like that first of all they don't come cheap and also sometimes they lose something in their efficiency because you've you've had to over engineer them to survive uh, the worst possible conditions in fact one of the uh, positive benefits of them is that where people have um, installed large offshore marine uh, uh, wave power systems, you find that the other side of the wave farm, you end up with relatively calm, flat waters. And there has been an argument that wave power devices could come into their own as we start seeing the impacts of sea level rise and damage in coastal infrastructure, where it could actually be cost effective to use uh, wave power farms off, you know, soft sediment shorelines. Uh, where you're trying to reduce some of the, you know, the, the, the power of the winter storms uh, to, you know, prevent some of your coastal erosion as well. The Palamis program, there's a little uh, red coloured sort of snake type uh, affair in the artist's impression from National Geographic there. Uh, Palamis had a lot of promise. Uh, this was one that was being engineered in uh, up in Scotland until uh, just a few years ago. And unfortunately, the company didn't survive 
uh, there is an almost identical machine being built uh, in a Chinese uh, yard at the moment with uh, certain level of suspicion that perhaps there might have been a little industrial espionage going on uh, there. But um, Palamis did get as far as being tested off the coast of Portugal, as well as the pilot projects in um, uh, Scottish waters as well, but wasn't quite able to break through to become a mainstream uh, device. The image number there, like number two on the image, those would be the, the Delta Stream proposals. One of these was tested in Ramsey Sound in Pembrokeshire a couple of years ago. Had to jump through a lot of environmental impact assessment hoops because they were worried about impacts on the local marine mammal population, but actually there, there were no problems at all. The, the seals rather enjoyed it seemed uh, surfing through the uh, vortices shed by the uh, blades which moved at a very low rate of rpm and if the blades did stun any fish the seals were more than smart enough to be able to get in there grab a, a free meal and get out again before the uh, blade came around to get them but we have had issues you know trying to get industry to really have some success with some of these uh, you know the wave power in particular less of an issue on the marine current turbine side uh, I think as these things start scaling up and we saw the very successful test in Stratford Lock a couple of years ago and now we have the Maygen project uh, up off the north coast of Scotland uh, already in operation installed by uh, Cymec Atlantis Limited phase one is just oh, another person to let in sorry excuse me Right, um, phase one is just four 1.5 megawatt turbines, but Project Stroma is now adding extra systems, and eventually we should be up to 49 turbines in place, sharing their electrical infrastructure with the local offshore wind farms. So it's been a success. It's working well, um, and the, the, you know, the system is up there in, in place off the north coast of Scotland in some of the harshest conditions you'll find anywhere uh, on the planet and so far it works i don't know if we've got anybody from cymec on the call today but when we get to the q and a's it'll be interesting to see if anyone's got any first-hand experience of this project to be able to share um a little local one for me i happen to live just around the corner from the proposed site for this uh, many of you will have seen on the news in recent years the proposals that have been coming in for a, uh, a demonstrator project of uh, tidal lagoon technology in Swansea Bay. So far, uh, we haven't had any success getting this thing turned into concrete stone and metal. Uh, the fundamental problem isn't the technology. This is a very, very straightforward structure to construct. I'm sure that uh, Isambard King de Brunel could have done this quite happily back in the Victorian era. But the cost of building these is very, very high. And if you're in competition against offshore wind or solar or terrestrial wind, it's quite hard to make an economic argument for the lagoon when you can produce, if, if all you're interested in is its ability to produce electricity, you can produce green, you know, renewable electricity for much less pounds per kilowatt hour with a wind farm or with a solar farm than you can by building the lagoon. On the other hand, once you've built the lagoon, it's cheap as chips to operate. Uh, you know, the thing will last for hundreds of years, uh, bar the occasional replacement of any worn out turbines. And by the nature of the predictability of tides, if you're selling your electricity to the grid, uh, building one of these things enables you to go to your, uh, the buyer of your electricity and give them extremely accurate predictions of when your, your peak demand is going to be available. Uh, the latest iteration of the design of the Swansea Bay Lagoon also includes a large floating solar array you know, over the center of the lagoon. It's not shown on this version of the artist's impression. So who knows? I don't know if Swansea Bay will ever make it to becoming a real world project. There are some problems uh, because they wanted to keep the carbon footprint as low as possible. The construction of the Swansea Lagoon has been uh, planned on the basis of using uh, natural rock uh, for the 
uh, containing walls. Uh, the natural rock would come from a, a currently disused quarry in Cornwall, and there's quite a lot of controversy uh, with the local Cornish uh, population about reopening that quarry, which I believe now has become a, a site of special scientific interest. Uh, were the lagoon to be built using concrete, you'd substantially reduce the cost of building it, but of course the carbon footprint of building it would be a lot higher. So it swings and roundabouts. Um, the other critical problem that Goon has is actually a bit too small. Uh, it's designed as a demonstrator, and so it's not a, it hasn't been scaled as big as it could be. Uh, if this thing was the size of the proposed sister lagoon that would be built further up the Bristol Channel towards Cardiff, uh, which has poss possibly six times the area, the economies of scale really start kicking in. So I think we will eventually see tidal lagoons built, but perhaps we're still just a little bit too early for them to come through right now at this stage. Uh, ocean thermal energy conversion. If you happen to be fortunate enough to live somewhere that has uh, nice warm surface water at about 25 degrees centigrade this works really really well you're basically using cold sea water from uh, the deep at about five degrees c so you need a 20 degree temperature difference and you're basically running a, a, a captive a circulatory system of bringing cold water up from the bottom uh, you know and getting the whole thing going around in a nice little loop there and you could potentially have almost free energy production in certain parts of the world uh, quite effectively from ocean thermal energy conversion. The designs go back a long way. You know, I can remember artists' impressions of these sites you know, from the uh, 70s and 80s. And a few pilot plants were built. And there are certainly several companies now marketing ocean thermal energy conversion as uh, power systems for, you know, small island resorts, um, uh, you know, individual towns, individual industrial facilities. The problem they have, again, is cost per kilowatt hour versus things like solar. Uh, you know, if you happen to be in those tropical parts of the world, there's no shortage of solar energy available too. So you're coming down to quite a complicated cost-benefit uh, race between is it worth building an ocean thermal energy conversion system versus building solar combined with energy storage. So you could have a solar system with backup uh, batteries uh, or you could have offshore wind and it might turn out to be quite a lot cheaper per kilowatt hour than operating an ocean thermal energy conversion plant. But this is an option, and I think I've got a speaker coming up in the podcast in a few weeks who's going to be talking about working on these ocean th thermal systems in the tropics, and it'll be interesting to see what he has to say. Uh, marine biomass, another area where we ought to be able to harvest some resource that we can turn into green, sustainable energy. Uh, it can be macroalgae, the big things like kelp, or microalgae, the small sort of single-celled single, single -celled organisms. Uh, large things, uh, you, you know, such as the, you know, we have here Macrocystis uh, periphera, uh, the giant kelp, it grows fast, it grows large. Some of the smaller single-celled uh, species, you can turn up to 60% of them into the hydrocarbon uh, lipids, potentially. So again, if you're in the right part of the world, you know, with a, you know, with good clean water supply, plenty of sunlight, marine biomass does give you the option for one of your uh, future energy resources and turn these things directly into, yeah. into fuels. Of course, these decarbonized societies may also require the metals obtained from the ocean floor. Uh, you know, whether if we stick with current uh, lithium iron type, type technologies we probably have to do some kind of seabed mining also for the rare earth metals required for the electric motors and the computer systems and such like but that's based on today's technology it could well be that some of the new battery chemistries uh, coming into production in the next few years won't require some of those exotic metals and perhaps the idea of a giant offshore mining industry might not turn out to be as realistic as today would, would apparently seem to be the case who knows? Uh, what we do know is that the uh, the big uh, proposal by Nautilus to successfully mine for copper 
off the off Papua New Guinea doesn't seem to have uh, succeeded. Um, as long as land copper and land nickel and land chrome prices are at their current levels, it's hard to justify the very high capital outlay of um, you know building specialist mining equipment to go down deep, and of course the environmental impacts that that might have. But who knows? You know, markets change. Now, the balance of power and power demand is going to be changing quite markedly this century. We know uh, it's very, very likely now that China will become the dominant uh, economic power of the, uh, certainly in the second half of the 21st century. And it does give us many opportunities for economic growth and new era of cooperation, hopefully of peace. But it does also raise the prospect of conflict with the existing superpowers. You know, it doesn't take much, much imagination to see where some of the current um, arguments are going and where they could lead to. And many commentators have pointed out that by powering that future economic growth with these clean offshore uh, systems rather than relying on today's dependence on hydrocarbons and you know, fossil fuels from volatile places such as the Middle East or from uh, economies such as uh, Putin's Russia the you know taking that uh, demand away from those economies could end up being quite an effective means of preserving peace into the 21st century you know we end up being able to locally source our energy it stops us being in competition with some of the great powers and gives us a sporting chance of being able to uh, hit those climate change targets as well. So a lot to be gained from there. You notice the artist's impression down there on the bottom right is looking at a future ice-free Arctic. Uh, that's looking more and more likely almost by the day and uh, takes quite a few thousand kilometers off the shipping routes between China and uh, Western Europe and the East Coast of the United States as well. So I expect to see those areas turn up uh, for as areas for commerce, you know, within our lifetimes. You know, it really isn't that far off now. So how does SUT fit into all of this? Because we exchange knowledge between industry, researchers, governments, the training, accreditation, scholarships. Uh, I would hope that societies like SUT and our sister societies like uh, in the Marine Technology Society, the Institute of Marine Engineering Science Technology, Challenger, IMECI, and the various others, we can all play our part in helping to transfer knowledge between what has been learned from today's offshore industry to the new ones that are going to be rising in coming years. And, uh, you know, where we found out things don't work, we can help the other guys and girls learn from our mistakes, the ones we've made in the past, and all hopefully try and do things better tomorrow. So I'll finish there. You can